to another edition of Behind the Brand. Let's go check out our next story. I'm Dave Asprey, the creator of Bulletproof Coffee, and you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. I'm Brian Elliott, welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with Dave Asprey in his brand new Bulletproof Coffee Shop here in downtown LA. Dave, welcome to the show. Brian, I'm happy to be here. I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? I got this job by accident. I was working as a vice president at a big internet security company and I decided to write a blog based on more than 10 years of experience that I had uh, on upgrading my biology. I used to weigh 300 pounds and my brain wasn't working very well, even though I was becoming very successful in my career, I, I bought disability insurance because I'm like, I, I don't know if I can bring it all day, every day, the way I think I should. And I realized one day, I, I actually figured this out, I solved the problem, I've lost 100 pounds of fat and I've got the, the physique that I wanted, but more importantly, I have the brain that I wanted and it's radically better than it ever has been. So I wrote a blog for myself 20 years ago. If only I'd known all this stuff, it would have saved me hundreds of thousands of dollars that I spent on making this happen and it would have just made life a lot easier for me in all kinds of ways, less suffering. So I wrote a blog for myself and figured if five people who are like me, you know, overweight and struggling, if they could just read it, I would, it would be such an act of service. And that's how Bulletproof was started. Well, that's where it is now. I guess I'm curious. I just want to understand because, you know, a lot of people who watch this show, they are just getting started or they're thinking about, you know, well, is blogging dead or should, you know, which social media platform should I put my content? Uh, and I want to give people some perspective. So, like, how long did it take you to sort of get traction? And, like, what does that mean when you first started writing? Like, was there 10 people that showed up? Was it 100, 1,000? Here's the trick. When you start blogging, it might take a very long time. So for the first year, I was getting really bad analytics that overstated the number of readers of my blog by 10 times. So I was really inspired to keep blogging every day. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. Believing for the first at least six months I, that I was getting 10 times more visitors than I was really getting. Yeah, what's that number though? Oh, geez. Was it 100, was it 1,000, was it Five years. It, it would have been in the hundreds. Okay. Right? And it depends, if you're like one of the, the I'm gonna get rich quick, I wanna work as little as possible and live on an island and sort of just like, like scalp the internet numbers kind of things, that's a different business than, than Bulletproof. Uh, that's not what it's about. So it, from that perspective, like, oh, 100 people, that's nothing. But where I am, I'm like, look, that's 100 lives that I, I can change the direction of them by at least a couple percent. Like, like it's really, it's a mission. Yeah. And so for me, I'm like, an audience of 100 people every single day, like, oh my God, like I have so much to give. And that's the point I kind of wanted to underscore because I think people get stuck on the numbers and they're really measuring the wrong kind of success. Even if it's just one person you're talking to, one is still better than zero. It's true, and gratitude is a core part of my practice for performing well and part of the bulletproof perspective. Well, that's gratitude embodied right there. Being grateful for the fact that one person's reading what you have to say is cool, but there's a flip side to this. I did some math the other day, and at the current rate that, especially with Bulletproof Radio, the, the podcast, as well as dwell time on the blog, I've used 127 human lifetimes, full entire waking lifetimes. So either if I'm adding value, great. If not, I'm a mass murderer at this point. Like you can waste people's time. Yeah. So if you're writing a blog, here's what I think about myself, which is what most small blogs are. There's just one question you always want to ask yourself and it's what's in it for you? Not you the blogger, but you the person reading the blog. Yeah, is there value? Yeah, if you're not adding value, like shut the hell up and listen and learn. Like, like tune in to Gary Vee or someone. Like, like there's lots of good stuff out there. Yeah. But if you're gonna bring stuff, you need to bring really good stuff and if your definition of bringing really good stuff is go to someone else's blog and copy and paste it, that's not bringing really good stuff. And there's a lot of that going on here, which is why blogging is really tough right now. Good stuff. Uh, let's get into maybe defining biohacking. Sure. Biohacking is the art and science of changing the environment around you and inside you so that you have control of your biology. And, and there's different things you might want to do. You might want to run a marathon. You might want to look good naked. You might want to have limitless energy and focus. Uh, you might want to live to 180 like I'm planning to do. All of those are totally cool. And you may want to just have really big earrings. I have no idea, but it's your body. You can do whatever you want to do with it. 
But the notion that the way you change isn't by like just wanting to change. It's not about willpower, although you can change your willpower. It's more about how your body responds to unlabeled and unhidden inputs, or unhidden, <laughs> how your body responds to unlabeled and hidden inputs from the world around you. You can manipulate those easily, but just willing yourself to get stronger doesn't work. I believe in science. You know, science works. Modern medicine, Eastern, Western, doesn't matter. You know, everyone has a good amount of information, but we don't know it all. It's disheartening and scary because many doctors don't have, they're not taught this, but they haven't learned it. And it's the idea that, that the things you try, drugs are one of the many things, but they're not the only thing. So you look at someone who's having type two diabetes, like, well, here, have some drugs. Well, okay, maybe just try what you put, what you put on your plate, maybe that should be different. Yeah. But a lot of doctors, they go, well, let's just do what the American Diabetes Association says. And what they're saying actually makes diabetes worse. And so since the doctors aren't trained in nutrition, unless they've become trained after they graduated in functional medicine, we're not getting the full picture of what we can use to control our bodies. And again, this is one guy's opinion, just you know, for me living my life. But like, I feel like also you go to the doctor and they specialize. OK, I'm an internal medicine guy. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care anything about your your heart or your digestive system you know it's like i just focus on you know whatever ears eyes throat right right and they're not really taking a holistic approach i had this experience where like something else was happening not dramatic or or severe but like they completely ignored the other part of the body which they don't specialize in and it's just like it seems like such common sense that we should be Here's how I got started as a biohacker, one of the big formative experiences. This was almost 20 years ago, and I went to the doctor, I'm like, I'm starting to gain weight again. I've lost you know, 50 of the 100 pounds I, I wanted to lose, uh, but now I'm just super tired. I, I, I can't even remember what I'm doing at work after. I'm like, something's wrong. And I remember, I said, I feel like I've been poisoned. And I said, but you know, vitamin C kind of makes me feel better. It's the one thing I found. And he looks at me and goes, stop, it could kill you. And I'm like, <laughs> really? And what about Linus Pauling? Linus Pauling won two Nobel Prizes, took 90 grams of vitamin C. He didn't know who Linus Pauling was, and I did. And I'm a computer hacker from Silicon Valley. Right. And I looked at him and I said, you're fired. And I walked out of the office and I said, I'm going to have to do this myself. Yeah. That was the wrong response. I just should have found a physician who was more integrative or more functional. And what that did for me, though, is it just made me feel like I had a profound sense of responsibility for my own biology. What he didn't ask was, what's in the environment around you? And what was really going on for me is I was living in a condo that had black toxic mold in the wall behind my bed, and it was poisoning me. He never thought to ask. I want to say, repeat again, because I think what you said is, is like, if you take nothing else away from this episode, is like, you are responsible for your own biology. Yeah. Right? I think a lot of us rely on science or medicine, and we take their word for it when maybe they don't know exactly what's best for us, they think that they know, but sometimes there's a uh, one-size-fits-all approach, or maybe, like I said, they're zeroing in on just one area. We have to be responsible, don't we? We have to be responsible, and, and this we're a system, and we interact constantly with the world around us, and a lot of people are like, I don't feel very good. It's like, okay, how are you sleeping? Well, what are the things that influence your sleep? One of the big things that influences your sleep is the kind of light you have at night. So if you're staring at a bright screen every night, it will, for four hours, turn off your melatonin. If you don't sleep, your testosterone levels are gonna go down. And you're not gonna have that zest for life that you used to have. And you're gonna look crappy in the morning. And you're not gonna perform well. You're gonna yell at the people you work with. And you're not gonna be nice to your, your family. And, and it's this whole thing. But wait, who would have thought that having put those new LED lights in the bathroom at night was completely destroying your sleep? Well, your biology will respond to the environment around you with or without your permission. It doesn't care, and, it, and it's all invisible. But we have the science now to show this. So how should we be paying attention to our own biology? If it's our responsibility, is it really as simple as how I feel? That is the most precious question you can ask yourself. When I first really got into this, I was in my, my work notebook back before it was all mostly digital. I, I, everyone would carry in Silicon Valley these notebooks with numbered pages. So if anyone sued you, you could prove when you wrote what down so you didn't steal their intellectual property. And they still do this. 
And in the, the binders, uh, in the edges, the margins, I would write, okay, energy crash, feeling really good, energy crash, just so I would have an awareness of how am I doing? Like, am I focused? Did I, was I there for the whole meeting or did I kind of tune out halfway through and just like want to go do something else? That's a great tip. So it's like a personal journal. You're keeping track of how you're feeling, maybe what you're eating, yeah. how you're sleeping. I, I tracked all that stuff for quite a while to find correlations and what I did find out was that about 48 hours after I ate gluten, I was a total zombie. But the day after I ate gluten, I wasn't, I, I was just fine. So that changed my personality when I stopped eating gluten altogether. My food cravings went down substantially, but I was a nicer person. What I learned, and a big part of the Bulletproof philosophy, and it's in, in my book, is about willpower. And most of your energy goes to just three things that keep your body alive. And the three things are run away or kill scary things, Okay, that's your fight or flight response, and mine was hyperactive, I was always hypervigilant, and that was nothing, that was not my fault, it wasn't a character failing, it's just a biological setting that I've changed. Uh, the other one is eat everything so you don't starve to death, and we all know that one, you put a plate of cookies in the middle, it's like, eat the cookie, no, eat the cookie, no, and you have this inner dialogue until eventually, like, I'll just eat half, and then I'll just eat the whole plate. It, it, that just happens, that's biological, that's not, that's not a failing. And the third thing is the other one that gets us in trouble, which is make sure the species reproduces. So those three things are all things that drain your willpower, or if you manage them carefully, they can actually help your willpower. So I've taught my nervous system to go out of fight or flight mode consciously. It takes a couple seconds. I did it before I was in this interview. I'm doing it right now. I'm consciously controlling that. How are you doing that? Well, I've done two big techniques that taught me that. The first one is called heart rate variability training, and you clip a little sensor to your ear, and you take a deep breath, and the iPhone light on it turns red when you're in fight or flight, and it turns green when you're calm. After a little while, about six weeks for the average client I work with, they learn, oh, this is what it feels like to go out of fight or flight mode. I have control. And it's like, this control is in all of us, but we're not trained on it. So is it like an anxiety or is it different for everyone? Like, is it a feeling of butterflies in your stomach or what, describe it? If you're really in fight or flight mode, like you walk into a meeting and you're like, or into a room, you're like, something's not right here. Like, like I, I don't feel good. And your heart could change a little bit. But a lot of times it's invisible to you because you're not attuned to that. It's something your body's doing, but it, it's like if you sat down in the cockpit of a 747, there's all these knobs and dials and, and, and indicators. And you don't know what any of them are. Our bodies are the same way. And what I do is I use technology to illuminate those indicators. Same thing with your CFO. Your CFO has like all these on the financial dashboard for a company, there's all these things. And okay, if you work in finance, you might know what all of them are, but you probably wouldn't know. And what we're doing here is using tech to tell you the most important settings in your body so that now you can read the, read the, the levels and then turn the knob up or down, which is an unprecedented amount of control. Yeah. Like 20 years ago, you had to go sit in Tibet in a cave for five years and you'd eventually attain this level of control or your phone could teach you. Like, I just want to learn. So it could be great for athletes or people in business before a meeting, before a speech. Most people, public speaking doesn't bother me for some reason, um, but other people would rather die, right? Like, a lot of people do that. I've worked with people who have problems with that. And the first step is that heart rate variability training. And the second one is something, I spent 10 weeks of my life with electrodes glued to my head doing intense meditation every day with a lie detector that tells me when I'm meditating wrong. And one week of this, the 40 years of Zen training like that is equivalent to about 20 years of one hour a day of meditation. And the idea is the brain is the most plastic organ in the body. It will change. Yeah. It, it wants to be as powerful and amazing, as connected as it can be. It just doesn't have very good signals to tell it what to do. So I use technology to tell my brain how to perform better. And it's completely changed my relationships. It's changed how I treat my employees. And it's changed my stress level. Like I'm pretty darn stable. I still have emotions and all of that, but I don't embody the stress. Like, like oh yeah, that, that's not what I wanted to happen but I'm not gonna die. And most of the time, as an entrepreneur, you and your company are the same entity. And when something bad happens to the company, a troll comes in, numbers are off, you feel like you're gonna die. Yeah, it's a dive bomb, it's like. Yeah, it's like, it's your baby, right? And, and like, it, it's an attack on you when someone says something bad about your brand. I don't have that. Like, people are gonna say what people are gonna say, and that's probably their own trauma, it's not mine. Yeah, a lot of people would call that emotional intelligence. So what's next? You talked about, you know, the fight or flight, then this willpower, um, I struggle with this all the time. And it's not because there's a plate of cookies in front of me, it's about convenience. So because we travel and we shoot on location a lot, it's like, okay, 
I've neglected breakfast, lunch. Now I'm starving. All I've got is some craft services, <laughs> garbage, and I just gobble it down. You know, how do I get past I that? I don't think it's really about convenience. Yeah. I think what happened is that you made choices early in the day when you skipped breakfast and lunch that allowed the amount of energy in your cells to drop. And at a certain point, your willpower ran out. You have X number of decisions you can make per day. Yeah, exactly. for sure, you're spot on. Yeah, and, and that's like proven now, finally. It, we always knew there was some kind of willpower thing, but everyone said it was all in our heads. Well, it, it's actually in your cells. And when you run out of energy, you'll run out of willpower. And even if you have energy, you can run out of willpower because you'd make too many decisions. So your decision can be, I'm not gonna eat that. And then five seconds later, I'm not gonna eat that. And each of those is a decision. Those same decisions could be, yeah, I think I will hire this key employee. I think I will work on the company strategy right now or whatever the important decisions were. Since your biology doesn't recognize important decisions from unimportant ones, you basically run out after a certain amount of time. You don't wanna make unimportant decisions. And if you allow you know, the, the, these core things, okay, I wanna eat that, no, I wanna eat that, no, or I wanna have sex with whoever that is, no, I wanna have, like you can let that fill up your mind and all of your decision power, all of your willpower gets frittered away. And if at the same time, you're in constant fight or flight mode because your biology's threat detection systems were set off when someone walked into the room who looked like someone who beat you up in second grade, you're running at like a third of your possible power and you don't even know it because all of this happened in a place that's invisible to most of us. So is it about making decisions ahead of time? Like I do not eat that kind of thing or I will be faithful to my partner or and like just maintaining that willpower? What well, is the, most what's of the these secret? urges are, are not cognitive. They're not thinking things. They happen before you think. They actually happen faster in the brain. Like there's a timing mismatch. So with food, the simplest thing to do is you eat food that changes your hunger hormones, and that's what I do. When I travel, I always have a couple things with me. In fact, I'll show you something yeah. that's kind of funny here. There's a kind of oil that I, that I make. I look maybe like I'm an alcoholic. I carry this around with me. There's not alcohol in it. There's brain octane oil. This stuff raises hormone levels that make you feel full and turn off hunger and it keeps my brain running all the time. So every time I have a meal, whatever it is, I just pour some on there and then I'm, I'm good to go. Yeah. How did you come up with that? Well, more than 10 years of running an anti-aging research group called the Silicon Valley Health Institute, I learned long ago about the power of, of sub-fractions of coconut oil. This is about 5% extracted. Like if, if we took coconut oil and made vodka out of it, sort of, this is that. And I started experimenting with coconut oil and I just got more and more pure. And it's, it's core science. And I'm a computer hacker. I look at the system of the body. I'm writing a book about energy in the brain right now because it's so important to manage energy in the brain. We have more inputs right now. Yeah, you talk about the brain, you're kind of blowing my mind because I think energy, not in my brain, I think energy in my body, right? And I feel like they're, they're different. They don't teach you this in any school. In fact, I had to dig for this information. We have these things called mitochondria in our cells, which are the power plants of our cells. Heard of that, yep. Okay, cool. Most people have now. And when I started working with mine, like in 97, people were like, mito, what? And the problem is that there's three parts of your body. We have 10,000 of them per cell. It's in the eyes, in the brain, especially the front of the brain, the more human parts of the brain, and in the heart. So this, these are the parts of the body that consume so much energy, a very disproportionate amount of energy. The rest of the cells have one in 2,000. So you have like five to 10 times more of these energy gobbling cells. I mean, they, they burn fuel, but they make energy. So if there's a brownout in your fuel supply, say your blood sugar's going down and you don't have any fat in the system, your body's like panic mode. And when you go into panic mode, you make bad decisions. You yell at your partner, you decide that you're not gonna do something you really ought to do, you just defer, you procrastinate. And the brownout, you're not gonna feel it at first. Eventually you'll crash and be like, okay, I'm really tired, I gotta eat. And if you wait till then, your performance has been inhibited for two hours before that, you just didn't know it. Unless you've got that, how am I doing now? How am I doing now? I'm like, wait, something's off. And I developed that partly because my brain was poisoned by environmental mold, so I was really sensitive. I had mitochondrial damage. Let's change gears for a second and, and talk about this entrepreneur lifestyle. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people watch this show, they're entrepreneurs, they've got their own business, they're in startup mode. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or is it something that we can learn to adapt to? Most entrepreneurs are born. 
you probably could with some of the, the neuroscience stuff that I'm working with now, like at the very top levels of human performance, you probably could take someone who's not naturally an entrepreneur and increase their entrepreneurial skill set. But I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. Uh, so why do you think that they're born? Why do you think it's in the DNA? The entrepreneurs, the really successful ones that I know and that I've become friends with, uh, they're different. And there's another kind of person that's born. It's an engineer. Uh, they have different brains. And if you do a personality profile test, by the way, everyone we hire at Bulletproof gets a personality profile test called the Colby score. I have a classical entrepreneur score. And it means I'm really quick to start things. I need to know enough facts to get things done. And my quote, follow through, I, I leave bodies. I, in, in, in other words, it's not my job to follow through. I'll, I'll light a fire and I have people, like you're the kindling people. <laughs> Is it still going? Does it look like a good fire? Okay, let's put some more fuel on that. But for me, it takes extra energy to do the things that are not my instinctual things to do. So I carefully built my life and my team to allow me to do the things that only I can do and things that, that give me the most joy and consume the least energy. I could, I have a degree from Wharton, an MBA. It's a finance school. You know how much I like finance? I don't like finance. It's boring, right? I, it takes energy out of me. So yes, I look at the numbers, but I have people do deep financial analytics of the numbers, and I don't spend four hours a day looking at 3D maps of the numbers because I have analysts who can do that for me. It's different when you're a startup entrepreneur because there's so much fear, and, and we can overcome fear with technology. Like We can teach you to not feel like you're gonna die every time you have to do something. But a lot of people are not cut out from an instinct perspective to be an entrepreneur. And you can measure what you're capable of doing and you can measure what's natural for you to do. You can learn to do things that aren't natural for you, but if you take someone who's naturally an entrepreneur and you enhance their strengths and you support their weaknesses with other people instead of by making them train their weaknesses, you end up with a really powerful entrepreneur. The thing that I would encourage people to think about is if you're feeling like you should be an entrepreneur, but it's not coming naturally to you, get rid of that. It's a bad program. Uh, that so, somewhere you learn, like this is how to be happy, this is how you learn to be popular, this is how you're gonna get free or whatever it is. You gotta find something that you absolutely love, that just gives you passion. And right now what's missing is uh, the, the operators. Okay, ideas are almost free. There's so many ideas out there right now, there always are. People who can bring an idea to fruition are not easy to find. So the COO role to work with crazy entrepreneurs like me is, is a very hard role. And there are people who are not entrepreneurs who are awesome at that. So there's no goodness. It doesn't make you a better person to be an entrepreneur versus to be a chief operating officer working with an entrepreneur. Right? It, it just doesn't. And also, I spent a lot of my life at small companies in Silicon Valley that got acquired by big companies. I've run strategy for two companies with more than a billion dollars in market cap of revenue and all this kind of, of stuff. So you'll spend time in big companies. I also find uh, we had Mark Zuckerberg be very successful in his mid-20s. So there's a lot of times where you see people in their mid-20s saying, I'm gonna go be CEO, and it's totally possible. But I'll tell you something, the very successful guys like Mark Zuckerberg and Mark Andreessen from the generation before that, the guy who started Netscape, I was writing articles reviewing Netscape 1.0. Uh, I'm about the same age as Mark Andreessen. I didn't, in fact, I'm the first guy to sell anything over the internet. My first article in Entrepreneur Magazine, I was 23 years old, and there's a picture of a 300 pound me wearing a t-shirt with a caffeine molecule on it, right? And I didn't go where Mark Andreessen did. He's like a multi-billionaire, right? The difference is that Mark Andreessen was smart enough to ask for help, and he accepted mentorship readily and easily, and I was too stubborn and angry to do that. So he went and he met Jim Clark, a senior executive from Sun Microsystems, and Jim Clark mentored Mark and taught him how to do this. The reason I can do what I do now is I spent 20 years in Silicon Valley, one of the most intense places, learning how to kick ass the way that I do. At the beginning of the interview, you said, how did you grow the brand? The real truth is that I've been a technology evangelist, like head of evangelism for companies with hundreds of millions in revenue, and if you have to stand on stage in front of a thousand people and convince them how exciting antivirus software is, that's hard. Standing up and saying, let me tell you how to look better, feel better, have more energy, and turn your brain on all the way, it's simple and fun. But most entrepreneurs, they suck at public speaking, 
and they don't know how to do it. So if you want to grow your online brand, it, it's not about Twitter, it's not about scalping the numbers, it's actually about being a really good, authentic, high integrity communicator and being able to stand up and tell your story in a way that people can see it and feel it and know that it's real. And that means it has to be real.